Welcome to the Savvy Doc Podcast. I'm certified financial planner, Catherine Magana of Savvy Doc Financial Planners. And I'm here with my partner, Steve Wolf. And we're here to help you take smart control of your money and life. Today, we have a special guest with us. We're going to have a discussion with Ethan Nakana of RMP, RMPA, which is Rocky Mountain Physician Agency. So welcome and thank you for joining us. And perhaps before we get started, Ethan, if you want to share a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, first and foremost, Catherine and Steve, thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to be here with you guys. Um, by way of training, I'm a lawyer by background, so I have Juris Doctorate, I also have an MBA, and really I had aspirations to be a hospital CEO. So I spent the last 15 years or so working in hospitals, uh, anywhere from operations, finance, strategy, legal, um, you name it, if it's in a hospital, I either know it or I've done it. And so now my work is as a uh, an agent for doctors, so similar to a sports management company, how they are agents for athletes, help them make more money. I do the same thing for doctors. Great. And so tell us a little bit more um, like how you work with physicians and doctors. Do you uh, educate them or do you handle everything or how does that work when they work with you? Yeah, phenomenal question. I, I do a little bit of both. So first and foremost, my mom is a doctor. And so I have a deep oh, passion nice. for helping physicians. And part of that comes from my belief that physicians don't have the appropriate and adequate training to understand their contracts when they go in to negotiate with hospital executives like myself, who did that every day. Uh, and so what ends up happening is physicians are at a costly disadvantage when they're having those contract and salary discussions. So one part of my business is purely educational. So I've been fortunate over the past year, I've done about 20 residency and fellowship education programs. So everywhere from Yale to Duke, uh, Johns Hopkins, um, I've been fortunate to educate their residents and fellows on physician contracting. So on one part of the business, purely education. The other part is is action, right? And it's about helping doctors. I, I do one thing and I help doctors make more money. And so the punchline is when doctors hire me, if they say, you know, Ethan, I, I love where I'm at. I'm not really interested in making waves. I just want to make sure my contract is tight. I have attorneys uh, I'll be happy to refer you to. Um, but what I do specifically is helping doctors increase their salary and compensation and I do that by using all of the things that I learned when I worked on the other side of the table for hospitals. And so do you, you know, do you do it for them or do they do it themselves or is it, how do you work with your clients typically? Yeah, it really depends on what the client's interests are. So for example, I have a group of six OBGYN doctors that we just, we closed a deal last week for them to make a, they got a million dollar salary raise. And for them, I did everything. So scheduling all the meetings, doing all of the outreach to find offers for them. Um, whereas I have other doctors, so I have a neurosurgeon um, who eventually wants to be a hospital CEO and he's much more involved in the process, right? So I would consider it more of a tag team than it is me going out and doing all of the prospecting, negotiation, and all of that, like I do for the OBGYN. So it really depends on the physician's preference. Some physicians say, Ethan, I want no part of it, just do it all. Uh, and others say, hey, I want, I want to be involved. I want to know what's happening. Uh, so I'm happy to do it either way. So it says on your website that it doesn't cost the physician anything. Uh, how do you get paid? Yeah, I get paid by the hospital. It's, it's what I call a pass through. So for instance, and I'll just use the example I'm working on right now. So the way my, my business works is my compensation is all performance based. So it's kind of like those cheesy lawyer commercials where they say, we don't get paid unless you get paid. That's how it works. And so with, with these doctors, for instance, um, we made them a million dollars on top of what they were currently making. And then what I do is it's very similar, Steve, to a real estate agent. So a, a, a person who's selling their house may say, well, I don't want to pay the agency fee or the commission. So what the real estate agent might do is increase the, the price, the listing price of the home to account for their fee. So I do a very similar thing. So for my doctors, when we close a deal, I negotiate RMPA's fee into their deal. So physicians will get a, usually it's called a signing bonus, starting bonus, retention bonus, but they'll get, I'll negotiate compensation of their contract and they'll use that, a portion of that to pay RMPA. So 
to use easy numbers, if a if a doctor got a one hundred thousand dollar contract um, and they had, and then let's say my fee was five thousand dollars, I would negotiate a signing bonus of say twenty thousand dollars, and the hospital would pay the doctor. Then the doctor would use that five thousand from the twenty to pay RMPA. So purely off is of there, performance. Is there a certain percentage that you get, or is it's different for each doctor? Yeah, there's typically a pretty standard percentage for individual doctors. It's 10% uh, on their new contracts and for um, groups of doctors or for larger than one, one is 15% on the whole contract. So are your clients or physicians, are they usually private practice or is it mixed or what kind of doctors do you serve? Yeah, great question, Catherine. So it's actually a mix. Uh, I tend to work mostly with employed doctors. So doctors who, like you or I, and you know, maybe in previous lives, where we had W two income and we had a boss. Um, most doctors work about seventy percent of doctors work in that environment, and so those are the doctors I tend to see most often. Who say, "Would you review a contract for me? Would you help me find a new employer?" Uh, but I also work with private practice. So I'm working with one private practice. Uh, considering an acquisition with a local health system. And then I just brought a private practice, or I just brought a physician on in New York who's looking to buy a private practice and then will negotiate with hospitals in the in the region for hospital services for her private practice. So private practice employed uh, and everything in between. There's this interesting world that I found lately, Catherine, of like private equity and management service organizations. So um, you know, employment and private equity and, and private practice are kind of the extremes. Um, but there's lots of kind of other options in the middle that I've become privy to for doctors as well. Go ahead. Is there a certain group of doctors that you deal with the most, or is it any doctor? Yeah, it's really any doctors. Um, I often get asked, especially by financial professionals like yourselves, I often get asked, well, how do I tier my my prospects or my clients? Um, typically, the way I would look at it is your top tier are the physicians with the most leverage. So that's going to be your surgeons or groups of physicians. So it can be an individual surgeon. Um, I have a neurosurgeon on the roster right now, as well as a trauma surgeon. Um, so those are typically your top tier prospects because they can they really have leverage in the market um, because they make the hospital um, a ton of money. Secondarily, you have what I call specialists, and those are typically what you could, might call interventionalists or physicians who do somewhat invasive procedures, but not quite surgery. So think cath lab, radiology, um, you know, emergency care, things like that. And then your third tier is your primary care family medicine. And just because those are the most common doctors that are out there, super important, uh, but just because there's so many, there's less leverage typically in negotiations. So uh, surgeons, specialists, and then primary care family practice. And so when should physicians start thinking about negotiations? Is it right out of med school? Or it sounds like to me from what you're sharing that potentially it's something ongoing that you're going to want to revisit, especially if you want to get paid more along the way. Yeah, your, your instinct is right, Catherine. So I would say first and foremost, depending on, you know, neuro, neurosurgeons have seven year residency, family medicine, I think is three to four. And so typically in your year before you finish residency, you should be really heavy into the job search, right? Look, getting some offers, talking to experts, um, figuring out you know what your number is, and then once you get your first job, that contract should be two to three years. So I just talked to a doctor today who had a first contract of six years. That's a really long time, and the reason I say that is similar. I told you I was going to use sports, but in sports, there's this idea of outplaying your contract where your contract, and Scotty Pippen is a really good example of this, where he signed a seven-year deal with the Bulls, and by year two, he was the second best player in the league. So, But he was being paid as the 200th best player in the league. And so by year two, he was outplaying his contract, meaning he was playing far better than how he was being compensated. And the same idea applies to doctors. So when, when you come into residency as an intern, you become really proficient through your time, and as you become an attending physician, you also become really proficient. And what you don't want is to become more proficient than what you're being paid for. So a two to three year contract is that sweet spot for new docs, first time attendings to say, hey, at three years, let's take another look at my contract. Maybe nothing changes, but in the event that the market's changed, my skills are more valuable, my volume has jumped, 
you know, we want to be able to address the compensation when those things have changed. And so uh, to answer your question succinctly, first and foremost, when you're a year, year and a half out from finishing residency or fellowship, and then um, any time throughout your career, if you need to do a review every two years to make sure that you're getting paid what the market says you should. So I know we get this question a lot as a financial advisor, or at least uh, by some people that says, you know, why do I need to pay you? I can do this myself. Um, I'm sure there are doctors who say the same thing to you. So how do you answer them? Yeah, I, I love that. And I say, well, then why do you pay your barber? Why do you pay your hairstylist? You know, you pay those people because they have a skill set that you don't have and they do it on a daily basis. And likewise, I've done this for 15 years. I've been in hospitals. I know what your executive is going to say before they say it to you. And so just like you wouldn't trust cutting your own hair, you wouldn't trust millions of dollars to to someone who doesn't have any training. So by all means, if you want to cut your hair in your kitchen, do it. But <laughs> I, I know that I'm going to do it better. So is there a myth or a misconception that physicians have with regards to negotiations? Yeah, there, there's quite a few of them. And, and Catherine, this is a point of that I think is really important. I'm glad you asked. The, the myth I think that's most pervasive is that doctors think their hospital has their best interests in mind. And, and I don't mean to villainize the hospital by any means, but the point is the hospital is a business. CEOs are incentivized on keeping your expenses low and your revenue high. Well, guess what goes into expenses? Physician salaries. So if I'm incentivized to keep my expenses low, why would you think then that I would want Dr. Smith's salary to be $50,000 or $100,000 higher? So I, I think what happens is that when doctors go into the negotiation or the recruitment even, and they're getting wined and dined and they feel like, oh man, they really want me, and they get a contract and they get told, well, this is a standard contract, we can't make any changes, or the salary is what the salary is, and the doctor really hasn't done their due diligence. And if you go to any of these websites, Merritt Hawkins, Doximity, uh, Medscape, all of these organizations provide data on physician compensation. And when physicians don't know what that data says, they often get hosed on that first contract. And then they call me for the second one and say, how do I fix this, Dr. Smith? And this actually, I got this call last week. The, the doctor who trained the resident who was now in practice was making $50,000 less than the doctor she trained. And so, you know, that's a really good example of one, they don't have your best interest in mind, but two, there are very substantial and well-documented disparities for women physicians and physicians of color. And so I often tell those physicians who come across my, my, um, my plate, like you must, must, must negotiate your first offer. You must counter it no matter what. And the easiest way to do that is by having more than one offer. And so when you look at these um, negotiations, you know, to me, it, I think of compensation, but do you look at hours and benefits? Do you look at everything when you look at these, these negotiations for them? Yeah, great question. So I think of it in, in three pillars, what I call the three Bs, your base, your bonus, and your bennies. So your base is the salary that you get just for showing up and doing a good job. You don't have to be particularly busy. You just got to not hurt anybody. Uh, next, your bonus, that's what's called at-risk compensation. So you have to take some action or complete a task to earn that. So it can be something as innocuous or simple as signing your contract and you get a signing bonus. Um, or it can be something much more involved like helping improve your hospital's, uh, let's say, surgical and surgical site infection rate, right? That's called a quality bonus. So if you can help the hospital improve its quality metrics on which it's measured, you can earn additional compensation for those improvements. And so I often think about bonuses as that's income that you don't necessarily count on, but it can make a huge difference, up to 30% of a physician's compensation. And then the third is I think what you were alluding to, which is what I call bennies. And that's the compensation that truly has value. Your paid time off has value, but you can't deposit into a bank. 
So I often say that Benny's is uh, really valuable for your lifestyle. It can be your PTO, your 401k investments or your match rate. Uh, it can be education loan debt assistance. It can be all of these things that are really valuable for you, but you can't necessarily deposit into a bank like a paycheck. So Ethan, how do people find out about you? Yeah, good question. Um, I'd say the the easiest way to find out about me is through some of the articles that I've written, um, medical economics, fierce fierce healthcare. Um, I've been really fortunate to um, put some, I think, meaningful education out there in print for physicians. Um, the other way to do it is through social media, uh, on Instagram, physician agency, uh, and I put tips and tricks for doctors uh, on a daily basis. And it goes back to your point earlier, Steve, about education. Uh, I think it's incumbent to educate doctors on what they need to know going to their contracts. You, you don't need me, truly, right? You want to work with me because it'll make you more money, but do you need me? Absolutely not. And so I want you, if you decide you don't like me, you don't like my business, I want for you to have the resources you need to be successful on your own if you want to do a DIY approach. And so something that triggered during um, this conversation was, so what if somebody wants to move to a different state or do you handle that as well? And do you have relationships, you know, across the U.S. or is it in certain areas? Yeah, I work nationally. And so I have clients. Um, I have two clients right now. One of them is based in Colorado. The other is based in Kansas City. But they're looking in Texas, California, Oregon, uh, and I should say up and down California since that's since it's huge, um, but they're looking all over the country. And so my process is the same. Having worked in hospitals for so long, I know who's incentivized to bring docs on. And so those are the people I reach out to. And I just say, hey, I have an amazing doctor who would love to join your medical team. Are you interested? And then I help facilitate a conversation between the doctor and the health system. And the pitch is easy, right? The pitch is you don't have to pay me. All I want to do is help get my doctor in front of you. If you like them, great. If you don't, you don't have to talk to them. Uh, and so if I can help a hospital system, I want to do that. Um, but really, my, my pitch is I will find a doctor a job anywhere. But the important thing for Dr. Snow is you don't have to leave. You don't have to pick up your family and leave the state, leave the town, change schools. You don't have to do any of that. You can renegotiate where you are. Those doctors I mentioned that are going to get a million dollars, in addition to their comp, uh, they're staying in their same with their same employer. So their job is the same, their home is the same, social network is the same, but they're getting paid a million more dollars to do their job. So um, that's really the value that I bring. It's truly in dollars and cents. Uh, and I wanna make doctors happy where they are, but if they wanna leave, that's cool too. Could you uh, negotiate my contract with Catherine here because <laughs> I need a million more dollars. I, I'm guessing that Catherine drives a hard bargain, so I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, so, Ethan, I, one of the things I was wanting to know is: so, if somebody they hop on your website or they get the tips and they, you know, they they're interested, and so where do they begin, or what's kind of the first step? And um, I don't know if you offer, you know, a phone call or just kind of if somebody's not sure what to do. What you know, what would be a good step for them? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that. I, I often think that when I say I'm a lawyer by training, that people think that I practice law, and that's not what I do. So if you call me, I'm not going to punch a button and start the clock. I, I talk about this. I've, talk, I've had two hours of conversations about it already this morning. I love talking about this stuff. And so when I get to help a doctor or hear a doctor's story, um, that makes my day. And so if a doctor finds me on my website, calls me, emails me, DMs me on Instagram, um, I'll respond, right? You don't have to be a client for me to help you. You know, if someone, you know, for example, if someone you work with, Catherine or Steve says, I have a question, I'm concerned, but I don't know where to begin. Call me. Let's, I'll tell you where you need to start. And this is for free, but start getting the data. The first thing you need to do is get the data. And the second thing you need to do is figure out if you're willing to leave or not. Um, because if you're not willing to leave your current employer, and I, I had this exact conversation with a doc this morning, if you're not willing to consider other options, you have to be okay with the worst possible outcome. And what I mean by that is, um, let's just say um, your interest is in getting a 5% raise. And you go to your employer and you say, hey, I, I've really busted my tail over the last year. My quality numbers are through the roof. My patients love me. I'd love, to, I'd love to increase my compensation by 5% to match the market. 
If you don't have another offer, here's the options, right? Either they do it, give you the 5%, they do some of it, they give you two and a half, three percent 3%, or they do nothing. And the answer is if, you, if they do nothing, you have to be okay with them doing nothing and you still showing up to work tomorrow. And so I often tell doctors that if, if you're not willing to at least explore your options, you have to be okay that they're going to say no and you just kind of kind of suck it up. What's interesting, you talk about the increase in pay, and one of the things that comes to mind for me is inflation's high, and you know it seems like there's those conversations are out there right now, or at least um, these are things that people should be, or physicians should be thinking about. Um, so definitely some uh, timely. So I know we've gone over a lot of information and material today. Um, is there one main point or takeaway that you'd like to share before we we finish? Yeah, I would just say. For financial advisors who are working with doctors, for doctors directly, advocate for yourself. It is so important. You know, I hear on a weekly basis, I hear doctors say, Ethan, I'm just an average, you know, insert specialty here, or, you know, I don't know that I deserve, I don't, or the one I hear most is, I don't want to be greedy. And I tell doctors, you've got to dis, you've got to dispel that. You you have to know that if you don't advocate for yourself, nobody is going to. And so I'm really fortunate where I get to come in and I get to be focused on the money and I don't have to say, well, I'm, I want to make my docs more money. And I'm very transparent about that. And docs don't have to feel as self-conscious about, um, you know, saying, well, I want more money. I deserve more because they're, they're scientists. Doctors are paid to, you know, be clinicians, not wheelers and dealers. And so I really think it's important whether you do it DIY or you hire an expert, you must, must, must advocate for yourself. See, I I think that's, I think that's really uh, the major point here is that you are the one who is doing the negotiating. So the hospital or whoever the employer is can't really get upset with the doctor. You know, he's not the one talking. So I think it's a great thing to do. Um, How's business? Is it good? Yeah, it's it's great. So I started, Steve, in uh, the middle of the pandemic, which wasn't so great. Um, but the deal I was just telling you about with the OBGYNs, we just closed that last week. And that was about eight months of generating interest about these doctors who were extremely frustrated with their current employer. And when they hired me, went out, got them a bunch of offers. And we just closed a deal where they're, I mean, it's it's a million plus, but um, for, they're going to make a million dollars more and they're staying with their current employer. And, you know, I'm really proud of that because when we first started working together, they said there were two things that were most important to them and neither of them were financial. The first was they wanted to stay with their current hospital. And the second was they wanted to stay together. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that we accomplished both of those things. The group stayed together and they stayed with their hospital and they got paid a lot more money to do it. So uh, things are That's really crazy. good these days. Well, good for you. Congratulations on your business, and I hope it continues to prosper. Yeah, thank you. And please know I'm here to support your advisors, your clients. Um, you know, I see such a symbiotic relationship with financial professionals because you all are just as invested in the physician's long-term success as I am. I just don't have the skill set that you all have after the deal's closed, right? So the doctors have made all this money. Now what? And so uh, I just, I lean on people like you so regularly um, to help my doctors figure out what do they do after they make, they make the additional money. So I'm just so glad to be able to spend a few minutes with you guys this morning. Well, thank you. And that is true. Obviously doing financial planning and investing and helping our clients, this is part of that is making sure they're getting compensated. And obviously the more money they are in their pockets, then the more they have to invest and plan for the future. So um, Ethan, we appreciate you today being a part of our podcast and your perspective on helping doctors negotiate their contracts and, and your process. So thank you so much for being with us today. And Um, And on behalf of Savvy Doc Financial Planners, we're here to help you take smart control of your money and life. Until next time, thank you for joining us. 